Well, hello sports fans and welcome to In The Loop with Jake LaHoop. This series is to break down the headlines and highlights from the previous week and to look at which teams had the best offensive and defensive production. Then look into the upcoming week and see what games and headlines you should be on the lookout for. Thanks for pressing play and now let's get down to business. Now let's start with the fact that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who will be featured on this week's Game Day Eats, is off to their best start since 2010 at two wins in the first two weeks. A lot of reporters and networks are still skeptical about how well this team can really do, and rightfully so. Now here's a history of the Bucks' playoff journey since their inception in 1976. Fourteen trips, six wins, and three of those coming when they won the Super Bowl back in the 02 and 03 season. And with those stats, I can see why the critics are still trying to hush some of the loyal and now bandwagon fans. But here's the thing, the fans smell chemistry. And they see the playful banter coming from the journeyman quarterback who was supposed to take over until Jameis Winston came back from his suspension, but it appears they love it. Ryan Fitzpatrick bursted into the season with a shootout against the person you don't get into those with, Drew Brees. And when the Bucks started trading touchdowns for touchdowns, all of social media started to focus on that game and they were right to do so. Magic was being made. Against the Eagles, the Bucks were the underdogs until about 11 seconds into the first quarter. Fitzpatrick going deep to Deshaun Jackson on the first play from scrimmage. The former Eagle is inside the 10 and takes it all the way. Now this also tied D-Jax with Jerry Rice for the most touchdown receptions over 60 yards in a career at 23. Now both of those games led to Fitzpatrick breaking an NFL record for being the first quarterback in NFL history to have 400 plus yards and four touchdowns in the first two weeks, again, chemistry. And this chemistry goes beyond a player to player relationship. It's also a player to coach relationship too. And now this is the first time in head coach Dirk Cotter's career that he's handed off play calling to his offensive coordinator, whose name is Todd Munkin. And this is also his first year as a full-time offensive coordinator. The plays we're seeing called are opening up the running lanes for the running backs, routes for the wide receivers, and the passing lanes for Fitzpatrick, creating one of, if not the most, exciting offenses Tampa Bay has ever seen. Now, this leads to the elephant in the room, which is famous Jameis Winston. He's coming off a three-game suspension, which came from him groping an Uber driver back in March of 2016. And we're not going to get into the details of his questionable history here, so we're going back to topic. Should he start in week four when his suspension is officially over? And some teammates like Deshaun Jackson say no. It's easy to see why he would be against Winston coming back as a starter, because Jackson has caught all nine passes that Fitzpatrick has sent his way for 275 yards and three touchdowns so far this season. As a side note, if you don't have him in your fantasy and he is a free agent, pause this right now and snatch him up. And he wants to continue the season with the strong relationship that he has with his current QB1, and I can't blame him. As of today, Cotter has not touched on what will happen after the Week 3 matchup against the Steelers coming to Raymond James Stadium and facing the Bucs. We'll see if our subscription to the Fitz Magic is renewed after Week 3. And now continuing our trend of NFL records, we move into our second year quarterback of Patrick Mahomes and the rodeo that went down against Ben Roethlisberger and the Steelers in Pittsburgh. Now there were some fans who were excited to see Alex Smith head up last year and some who thought it was doomsday. So far, it seems that the first camp has been right. Mahomes set an NFL record for most touchdowns in the first two games of the season with 10 so far. Again, no other quarterback in NFL history has done that and the kid is only 23 years old. A fun fact to add here is that this is the first time since 1986 that the Kansas City Chiefs were able to win in Pittsburgh. And they've only had six trips since then, but still, that's a long time not to have a victory in one spot. And back to Mahomes, he has been able to distribute the ball with ease. Of those 10 touchdowns, seven have been to different receivers, with four of those being their only catch of the season. Obviously, the Chiefs want to get the ball to Tyreek Hill as much as possible, and he leads the team with three of those 10 touchdowns. An addition the team made in the offseason was adding former first-round pick Sammy Watkins. Now, this is his third team in five years, so one could say that he's almost at that journeyman status, but should one. Anyway, Watkins comes in after a solid season with the Rams, stats-wise, where he hauled in 39 receptions for almost 600 yards, but he had eight touchdowns. That's a strong ratio. The questions the coaches have is, can he 
overproduce from his current career highs. And those currently stand at 65 receptions during his rookie campaign in 2014, then 1,047 yards and nine touchdowns the next year in 2015. Now, some have coined the Chiefs as this year's greatest show on turf, which seems to have turned into a yearly title since the 2000 Rams were the most unstoppable force on the field. And the thing about unstoppable forces is that there is always an immovable object out there who can stop them in their tracks. Will the Chiefs run into that defense during the regular season? If they don't run into it during the regular season, maybe the playoffs? We'll have to find out. $100 million. Not many things are worth that much, and I can't even think of what would be. Taking over the Raiders' head coaching role is definitely not on that list. John Gruden says differently, but he may be regretting that decision after losing to the Broncos in the last six seconds of the game when Brandon McManus edged through a 36-yard field goal to take a one-point lead. Harsh. Especially since the Raiders seem to have the game in hand through the entire game until the last drive, of course. You have to question Gruden's decision to trade previous first-round pick Khalil Mack for two first-rounders from Chicago, especially since his stats alone are the equivalent to the Raiders' defense's entire production so far this season. Two sacks, a fumble recovery, and an interception. One guy compared to a whole defense. I'll give you a moment to let that sink in. Now Gruden does have four first-round draft picks in the next two years, and maybe he can find a new Khalil Mack in the draft. The problem is striking gold twice in a decade, let alone finding an NFL star twice in a decade. Growing up in Tampa Bay, I saw firsthand that Gruden builds his rosters like a cheap whiskey, old and ineffective. And now you can say he won a Super Bowl, so he obviously knows how to win. But let's take a look at that. 94% of the Bucks Super Bowl winning roster was drafted or brought in by Tony Dungy, but the owners got tired of getting so close to the big game and not getting in that they fired him. Little did they know that they traded their future for the in the moment. We pointed out the Bucks' playoff history above, and I'll point out that besides the Super Bowl run, Gruden's teams only made the playoffs once, which was a wild card round that they lost. Two seasons later, he would be fired and the team moved on to more mediocrity. But back to last week. Derek Carr did have a career day and set our third NFL record of the week with a completion percentage over 90% with 30 plus pass attempts. This silver lining is a positive for Oakland Nation because now the focus goes to the defense to stop those late game winning drives that teams seem to make on them. With that recap, let's look at which team had the best offensive and defensive productions from last week. Starting with the offensive side, we're looking at two teams who had massive results and just so happened to be in the same game. The Chiefs and the Steelers turned Heinz Field into the Wild West with both quarterbacks having career days. Looking at their combined stats, it was insane that neither defense showed up to play. Both teams combined for a total of 79 points, 924 yards, nine passing touchdowns, and one turnover. Kansas City scored 21 points to zero in the first quarter, and then Pittsburgh returned the favor in the second quarter with their own 21 to zero thumping. Kansas City then pushed the gas and wiped the field with Pittsburgh's defense and never looked back. Mahomes fumbled on the last drive, but Pittsburgh couldn't recover it to make a final push for the win. On to the best defensive performance, you can see that it looked like the Rams didn't even allow the Cardinals offense onto the field. Both teams combined for 34 total points, which happened to all go to the Rams. And out of the 569 total yards, the Cardinals had 137 of those. 83 yards through the air and 54 yards on the ground. The Cardinals had five first downs and the Rams had 24. Something else to note is that through eight quarters of football so far this season, the Cardinals have scored only one touchdown, which was a rushing score by David Johnson. Sam Bradford came over from the Vikings this offseason and is not having really any positive or even neutral adjectives that can be used for his play so far. And the question now becomes, is it time to start Rosa? Week two is capped, so we'll take a quick look at week three and see which game should be the best of the bunch and worth watching. Starting you off tonight is the New York Jets coming into Cleveland to face the Browns. Can the Browns finally break open those beer cases Bud Light strategically placed in bars throughout the city, or will they have to rotate them out for the third week in a row? Only two divisional games are being played this week, with New Orleans heading into a Atlanta and riding off a tough first two weeks with a loss to the Tampa Bay Bucks and a near miss to the Browns last week. Then the Tennessee Titans make a trip to Jacksonville, facing the Jaguars coming off a defensive stronghold against the ageless wonder of Tom Brady. Now the Titans will be without Marcus Mariota, who is having issues with nerves in his throwing hand. Your week three will end in Tampa Bay as the Pittsburgh Steelers head south to face the Buccaneers, which we'll also be covering with this week's Game Day Eats. Tune in Monday for that episode. You're in the loop for week two and ready for week three? Make sure to subscribe to get the latest episodes and be ready for those throwdowns with all things NFL related. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the field.